All right. A pleasant Friday to everyone. I hope your week has been going well. Uh, lots of fun stuff in store for today. Uh, one thing I want to note, our final lab, Lab 5, uh, has been posted. Uh, it will be due uh, 9 p.m. last day of class, June 3rd. Um, and uh, I am not allowed to offer extensions past the last day of class, so you will not be able to use late days on Lab 5 uh, for that reason. Uh, so important to get an early start on that one. It will be implementing a... Uh, it will be about networking, implementing something called a proxy server. Uh, we should start with networking stuff today uh, and uh, finish with it on Monday. So uh, the main thing to do this weekend with Lab 5 is to read through the handout and come with your questions on Monday. Uh, speaking of questions, uh, any questions about uh, the Malik Lab or uh, the I.O. stuff we've been talking about? Mm-hmm. Yes, so uh, this was the function that let us uh, redirect kind of one file to another. So if I run this command in the terminal cat foo.txt, it's going to read the contents of foo.txt and send it somewhere. Where is this command going to send uh, the stuff that it reads from foo.txt? The standard output version. Yeah. It sends to standard out, which we know is file descriptor. Yeah, it's file descriptor one. Uh, but if we don't want to send it there, and instead we want to send it to some other file, maybe I'll call it output, I need <clears throat> some way to have this command, which is going to uh, send to file descriptor one, to make that instead redirect to this other file. So if I have if I've opened this output file and it gave me back file descriptor three, I then want to use this do to function to say make uh, there is this file descriptor uh, 3, make file descriptor 1 act like file descriptor 3. So now when the command catfoo.txt sends it out, its output to file descriptor 1, I, through this call, have made file descriptor 1 an alias, just another name for the file that's open under file descriptor 3. So it's a way to take a file descriptor and make it just refer to some other uh, open file. Uh, questions on this or, or other I.O. or LAMP4 questions? What's that? If you have the um, file open under like multiple, like the same file open under like multiple file descriptors, and then you write to the file. Would that be reflected in each instance? Yes. Uh, all of if you have it, the same file open under multiple descriptors, uh, you are keeping separate track of like your current position in that file. Um, but the actual bytes in the file aren't duplicated. So if those bytes change, it changes for all of them. All right, so I want to start off 
uh, with a quick demo to uh, highlight um, uh, on kind of interesting phenomenon when it comes to uh, I/O in these in functions in kind of C library functions like printf. So I have a short program here um, that's doing something a little contrived, where I have a for loop. 4096, and I'm just printing out the number 0 to 4095. But I've set this up, so after the for loop completes, I try to print out the integer pointed to by x, but I've made x by null, uh, x equal null, so this is going to sig fall. I'm going to try and dereference a null pointer. The program's going to crash. And so the question is, uh, what am I actually going to, to see printed out? Will I actually see the number 0 through 4,095? So if I run this, I see something rather surprising. I see that it stops at presumably 3,908, but it doesn't even finish 3,908, it sort of segmentation faults in the middle of that. And so particularly when you are debugging, uh, such as debugging lab four, and you're using prints to help you debug, being aware that this sort of thing can happen is important because when the program crashed, it was in the middle of printing, and the crash prevented us from seeing actually the full amount of prints. What is going on here is that when you call printf, you are telling the system, print this eventually, rather than print this immediately. Anyone have a guess as to why telling the system, print this eventually, this is done for, for efficiency, why it might be more efficient to have it printed eventually rather than print it immediately? Tom? Um, is it because of the, uh, like, the local memory thing where like print is stored somewhere else than everything else. So if you call print and then go back and call print and go back, that's less efficient in terms of like the transfer than just calling it a bunch of VMs. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I don't I don't think uh, like there might be a small advantage in the kind of locality of the code here, but uh, it would be it it would not be like the significant reason why why it would it would work this way. Kevin? Um I if I recall correctly, it's got something to do with standard out, but if it's print, but the high track standard out, so then um for some reason like like because you only have one standard out per program So then it just says, okay, go do your thing. And then after you resolve all the code, make sure that the standard out is like casual, then you can like try to it out. Uh, that's on the right track. We are getting a benefit from sort of uh, deferring when we handle all this printing. Um, fine. Could it, could it be just to avoid the fact like if it crashes, then you won't need to print anything out, so you won't waste that time? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think that we're uh, we're trying to be more efficient, particularly in the case where this this uh, program crashes. Oh, so. uh, it's better off to like continue through the loop than waiting for the print statement that might like take a while to print. Yeah. So this is getting to the heart of it. There's something that we have to do to actually cause output to appear that might be slow. And it's better to, you know, be able to continue to make progress without having to wait for that slow step each time. So, as we were talking, when, when we were talking about uh, I/O, there was a kind of fundamental thing that we were using to actually send bytes to a file descriptor, send bytes to, uh, to say, standard out. Nick. Yeah, and the specific system call, 
the sorry, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's so it's the system call specifically the write system call is what actually sends the bytes to standard out. So printf underneath has to use write. Why would it have to use write? Why couldn't it just you know send the bytes entirely on its own? Fine. Exactly, because the kernel sits between <coughs> the program that wants to print and access to something like the screen or the standard out file. And a system call such as write, which involves turning control over to the kernel and then getting it back, that is a relatively slow operation uh, on the order of kind of more than 10,000 cycles. So our CPU could execute more than 10,000 instructions in the time it takes to hand over control to the kernel, do the write, and get control back. And so to make this more efficient, these things like printf are standard library functions, as well as uh, the Rio functions that you'll use in lab five are what is called buffer, meaning that instead of immediately calling write, printf just takes what you want to print and puts it in a temporary array, puts it in a buffer. And then kind of in the background, things from this buffer are being kind of sent to write in maybe larger batches so we can have fewer calls to write. So we print out, we call printf 10 times, and then the system like gets around to calling write because the buffer is full. And so we have fewer calls, fewer of these system calls, which makes it more efficient. But we see a behavior like this where you know, we haven't actually finished writing out everything in this buffer at the time the program crashes, and so it never shows up. Questions on this? Does this make sense? Anders? Can you say that again, like it actually executes when the buffer is full? Yeah, so the way, let me prevent this from falling asleep. Do, Okay. Um, so for this buffered write, we have some array of characters sitting in the kernel, and or or rather that the standard library is keeping track of that we can think of printf is keeping track of, and when we call printf the first time, we fill up a little bit of the buffer with what we want to print out. We call printf again, it fills up more. Once we've called printf uh, maybe 10 times, this kind of store, temporary storage is full, and so we need to clear it out to make room for more um, uh, calls to printf. So then we make the system call write with the contents of this buffer, and that clears it out. We've actually printed all that content, and now we can kind of start buffering more output. So there would be multiple buffers for the different functions to be used? Yes, and I think we would need a separate buffer for each file descriptor that we want to write to. Is if I say print to standard out and then also write something to a file, those those two strings like can't sit in the same buffer because they're going to different places. Um, so uh, there'd likely need to be some at least somewhat sophisticated logic for this like keeping track of the, the different buffers and where uh, that stuff should go. Oh, is there some sort of like uh, Eric key uh, like Say I call printf once, and then I call a bunch of like writes. So that would be two different buffers. 
is there something that said like, oh, because print was called first, we first have print before we write? Uh, so, I don't know if I'm yeah, so if we're talking about the order in which stuff shows up, um, the it like it will be put into the buffer in that order, so it will eventually be printed out in the same order that it was initially put in. Um, one other interesting thing is that we actually have a function that can tell uh, uh, the system to flush everything out of the buffer. To not wait until it fills up and just actually print or write whatever is in the buffer at that moment. Uh, that function is called fflush. And I give it the file descriptor that I want to flush, that I want to force the, uh, the actual output from. And so if I add this uh, flush here, or maybe even better, just do it kind of once at the end. Uh, to make sure that before I do this segfault thing, that everything is forced out either way. I think I'll do it the way inside the loop. So if I add this f flush, say, kind of each time through the loop, force stuff to be printed out. And then I compile and run this. I actually see that the full kind of 4,096 different numbers get printed out before I get to that segmentation fault. Uh, this will make the program slower uh, because it can no longer take advantage of this buffered output and it's just, uh, I'm forcing it to make this system call every single time around the loop. Like I said. Um, so the, se the segmentation fault, that doesn't go through the write buffer? Uh, just limit, like, does it go through the write buffer? Uh, that's, um, so this, say, uh, this segmentation fault error message uh, is being displayed kind of when the operating system is terminating this program. Um, so uh, the, I, I don't know what function the operating, the kernel is using to print this message. Um, Maybe it goes through a write buffer, but if it is, it's a write buffer connected to the kernel, not to the program that just ended. Other questions? PJ. Uh, are you saying, like, why did it only get to, like, three... 3,000 yeah. something. Um, that is, it only got to there because that's how much of the buffered output had actually been written at the time of the segmentation fault. So the numbers after that happened to like 495 in the buffer. Exactly. They were sitting in the buffer waiting to be written to standard out, uh, but then the program crashed and that buffer got thrown away. Got it? So then, if I flush, like, it doesn't empty the buffer, or it does? It does. It says you must print whatever is in the buffer, you must write whatever is in the buffer and empty it right now. Oh, okay. So, so essentially, like, that's okay. So, what, what, what can get into the buffer, print it right away? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Fine. Now, I assume then that as they have interest this thing, but I assume that buffers are of a certain size, and so they don't complete all the way. And the reason that we like we even got anything out before the segmentation was because I assume the the buffer cycle lasts a couple of times. Yeah, the the uh, standard library internals, the code that is doing this buffering, has picked some size for the buffer, and thus picked some interval at which it will flush it without being forced to. Um, and yeah, that was why we saw any output at all um, before it crashed. Um, and yeah, it would have to be doing something reasonable where like new input comes in and the remaining space in the buffer isn't big enough, so then it has to flush it then before it can uh, buffer that, that latest input. So there's like various edge cases 
the actual implementation of this would, would have to handle for sure. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, how big is the footprint? Like, can you address that? Like, if you are just a small amount of visuals, yeah, I don't know how big the default size of the buffer is. Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of a C library function that would let you adjust that, but there may be some way that I'm just not familiar with. Um, in principle, there's no reason you couldn't adjust it. I just don't know if that feature exists. All right. So this was about buffered writing. Uh, we have uh, the same idea can apply to uh, buffered reading. I just wanted to draw a quick uh, diagram of this. So we have some buffer, and we maintain a pointer to the start of that buffer. And uh, kind of as we are reading from this file, we have Some portion is this buffer that we've already read, and then some portion of the buffer that we haven't read yet. Uh, and we probably also keep track of kind of how much of the buffer is left to read. And the idea here is that uh, when the user call uh, uh, asked to read from this file, uh, we uh, provide kind of bytes from the unread portion of the buffer, and when we have kind of delivered all of those to the user, we then uh, call the system call read on the underlying file to sort of refill the buffer with new bytes uh, uh, from the file we're reading. So we're kind of using the system call to read big chunks of data from the file, and then using those chunks buffered in memory to provide kind of how, whatever amounts uh, the user is reading until we've provided all of those, and then we refill the buffer. Rebecca. So then is that like count how it keeps track, like the current position of the file? So this is our, our read buffer. I have, there's also an actual like open file that this system called read is, is interacting with. And uh, files are just sequence of bytes. Uh, and so you know, our file, uh, we can, we have some kind of current position that we are in the file that the kernel is keeping track of. And this portion that is in the buffer is part of the file. And we have the already read portion, the unread portion, uh, but when we're looking at the actual file, we have some part of it that we haven't read at all. That remains to be seen. And perhaps some portion of what we've already read that kind of was brought in the buffer, given to the user, and then was overwritten by kind of the next part of the file. <coughs> why, why do we do like a, a read buffer in the first place? Like I could get like you know because the right one you have a system call that you know like that's just, uh, ten thousand cycles, but you read a file uh, during the process, would you just get the whole file into the memory? Um, so, uh, we, what if our file is like 10 gigabytes? We can't afford, we wouldn't want to just always bring the entire 
file into memory if as soon as we open it. Um, so we'll kind of bring the file into memory, perhaps kind of as we read it. And uh, if the user is kind of maybe just reading one character at a time as they're processing this file, we wouldn't want to make a system call for every single character of the file. We'd rather use this buffered approach where we make a system call to get big chunks of it uh, and then can very cheaply kind of provide one character at a time out of the buffer. So, so it's somehow like, like, like locality, like you care about what the, what the bytes are around the current position, but not like for the position. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That this buffered reading is sort of optimizing for a sequential read of the file. We're going to kind of read continuous chunks of it. If we're just jumping around to random spots in the file, uh, a buffer is not going to help us. Yeah. So I'm still not sure what like not and buffered on Steam cards are. Like, so we know in write you have to empty, you have to flush the buffer at some point, but for the read you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to wait until the buffer fills up to then empty it and then stop it up. So like you want to like keep adding more stuff as you're reading. So like are we replacing the already read portion with the new one and then like going back in full circle and then doing that or like how Yeah, exactly. The idea is we have some bytes from the file in the buffer. Once we have once all of them have been read, we're then going to replace them with kind of the next chunk of the file. Like this unseen portion, we replace what's in this buffer kind of once we have read all this unread. Portion. So we're kind of taking a chunk of the file, putting it in the buffer, and then once the user has read all of that, using the system call read to get the next chunk of the file into the buffer and kind of repeating in that fashion. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, okay. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So, so basically, it's not like I read a character and I build this character, it's like the whole chunk being read. Then yeah, the idea is to reduce the number of times we call this system call. So we kind of want to call it only occasionally to get big chunks. Any other questions on this? I guess, is there a lag? Like, I'm thinking of like in a video setting, in like a streaming sense, like when you do the read again, after you've already read the first buffer, like wouldn't there be like a delay so wouldn't, there, wouldn't you want to like already read like slightly before the buffer mm. fills up? Yeah, so I'm sort of just describing a like pretty simple approach to this, but you're absolutely right that if we're in some sort of real-time streaming, we definitely want to be reading ahead, not waiting until the last minute to get the next chunk. So for that, like as the user is reading, we're calling read to sort of fill in chunks kind of behind uh -huh. so that we're, we always have some kind of amount of runway uh, so we can keep providing advice to the user. Okay, thank you. Kevin? Um, is there a difference between a read buffer and a write buffer? Is there even a write buffer or is it just one whole? Uh, so they are just like arrays of characters in memory. Um, so no difference in that sense. They're just used for you know, writing or, or reading. Uh, Would the error buffer sort of not exist because you want to get the error out as soon as you hit it? Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I'd have to test it to find out. Um, uh, when we are thinking about error messages, those are exactly the sort of things that we'd want to flush immediately. Um, so it certainly would be reasonable for like standard library functions that are specifically about printing error messages to include their own like their own call to flush as part of that function. Uh, I don't know if it's on my head if they do, uh, but you could like write your own little wrapper for printing errors that included that flush. Like yeah, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this the read buffer right. So is it like after a bunch of like there'll be the calls like build up in the read buffer and then you like call read, or is it that you call read and request like a big chunk and then slowly like give it to the reader? Uh, the second one, okay, exactly. Gotcha. All right, let's uh, 
quickly check our understanding. So first, what is the system call? All right, so movement toward B. Uh, that's excellent. That is what a system call will do. Um, anyone remember a system call we've talked about that is not related to file I.O.? Anders? Uh, exception, um, exceptions are the kind of general class of thing that is transferring control to the kernel. Uh, there are some like page faults that happen automatically and some like system calls that do it sort of at the direction of the, the user code. Um, but I'm thinking of like a specific system call that just isn't like read or write or open these IO ones we've been talking about. What? Well, when something is in the cache. I don't remember the specific structure, but then they have to go down one level. Um, yeah, a cache miss or a, or a page fault is a kind of exception, but it not it's not a system call. It's not like a, a function that our user code is is calling. So, Alexander. Would you like turning the like, system off, the computer off? Uh, there is, uh, yeah, so there, there would be um, uh, a system call to do that sort of thing. One that's come up in class is the system call sbreak, which extends the boundary of the heap. Uh, and you're like in the uh, extend heap uh, function in lab four, it actually calls kind of to add a new chunk of bytes to the heap, it calls S break in order to, to do that. So there are system calls for all sorts of different things we our program needs to ask the operating system, ask the kernel to, to do. Um, any questions on this? You should? So for other like um, standard I.O. functions like printf and you know get is those also like passing control from the user code to the kernel? Uh, so those are, so when, when my program calls printf, it goes into the printf function, which is not in the kernel. So I, just by calling printf, I didn't pass control of the kernel. Um, when printf, when, if printf, say, fills up the write buffer and then calls the system call write, at that point, control passes to the kernel, but it's not, but calling printf itself isn't kind of where control is passed. All right, let's also check uh, why is buffering I.O. often more efficient than non-buffered I.O. Uh, very nice. Our Jordy has it correct. We buffer I.O. to reduce how many of these read and write system calls we have to make. Any questions on that? All right, so today's first in US history is the first solo transatlantic flight. You see here Charles Lindbergh, uh, the pilot who uh, took off from New York and 33 hours and 30 minutes later of continuous flying landed in Paris in 1927. So it's not actually the first transatlantic flight. Two British aviators had done one eight years before, but this was the first solo one and also the first American. And we're talking about American history, so this is what we've got. Uh, Lindbergh uh, did this flight in the spirit of St. Louis, plain pictured here. Um, and uh, this uh, businessman, Raymond uh, Ortig, had set up a $25,000 prize to the first person uh, who could do this um, to kind of incentivize uh, uh, progress in aviation. Uh, so Lindbergh won this prize, which would be worth over $400,000 in today's money. Um, and uh, this trip made Lindbergh a basically instant global celebrity. So he landed in Paris uh, late at night 
and there were police trying to like hold back the crowd, and this didn't work, and 20,000 people rushed into the field. Uh, it was at night, so this is not a picture of that. This is uh, him landing in London a week later. Uh, the crowd pressed in so close it actually damaged the plane. Um, when Lindbergh made it back to the U.S., there was enormous ticker tape parade down the streets of New York City. Um, uh, he was uh, a, an incredibly popular figure. Um, and uh, he went on to kind of be involved in some kind of scientific medical innovations, um, some, exp uh, some exploration. Uh, he was also uh, firmly in the isolationist political camp in the 1930s and 40s, believing that the United States should not get involved in uh, the wars in Europe, for example. Uh, this is one of the several times the phrase America First has appeared in U.S. politics. He was a spokesman of the America First Committee, advocating for not getting involved. Um, and kind of later in his life, after the war, he was heavily involved in conservation efforts, including being instrumental uh, in setting up a, a national park on Maui in Hawaii. Uh, so that's Charles Lindbergh. Let's talk about another important uh, development, uh, the development of the internet. So the internet began life as a, uh, a US Defense Department research project called ARPANET. And in 1969, uh, this was the entire ARPANET. Uh, one year later, it had a few more connected nodes uh, in 1970. You can see still a uh, cluster in uh, California, a mix of universities and research corporations, and uh, a cluster in uh, kind of the Boston area. Um, and by 1977, you could still actually draw the entire internet kind of, uh, and make a map of it. Um, it's a lot harder today. There are over uh, a billion kind of connected uh, hosts, like different uh, uh, websites or, or places you can uh, connect to. Uh, so a lot harder, harder to draw. Uh, here's a cool uh, animation where kind of the redder colors are higher internet use and the bluer colors are lower. Uh, and you can see the kind of this shadow. Uh, this is a kind of time lapse over the course of the day, so you can see how kind of people are using the internet less at night um, and more during the day. Uh, and the way in which the internet uh, kind of connects people across the globe, a big important part of that is the submarine cables. Uh, so there are cables running uh, across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, uh, along the coasts, uh, and this is a map of um, uh, a few years old now, but of all the different submarine cables that uh, crisscross the globe to connect uh, the global internet. Uh, sometimes things go wrong, as you might expect with cables kind of lying underneath the sea. Uh, sometimes something hits them and they get cut. Uh, there is worries that a particularly violent solar flare could just knock out all of these cables um, and just disconnect the, like, now, like, the U.S. Internet is just completely disconnected from the Internet in, in other places, which uh, would be pretty strange. Um, and so this is sort of the, the big picture structure of the Internet, Lev. Any idea what the cable is that runs from Texas to Mississippi or Florida? Uh, this here? Yeah. Um, I don't have any specific knowledge about that cable. Um, I, uh, I, it's, it's one of, uh, kind of many cables that sort of run along, uh, coastlines. Um, I mean, what I, my, what I would imagine is like having, uh, some redundancy in this network including by kind of running these cables along along the coast um, can be can be helpful to maintain the uh, the, the backbone. Yeah, you should. So before we have the those like, you know, separate cables, let's say like in the seventies, so they just have like a huge cable from like UCLA to MIT and all the across. Uh yeah, so in uh, these lines here, there they wouldn't have been like separate cables uh they would be uh, it would have this the data would have been traveling along the telephone 
line. So the same cables that carried your voice on the telephone would be carried, carrying the information uh, for the internet. And this was true into the, into the 1990s. Other questions? Why? Uh, well, Ethernet is a kind of more modern um, kind of connection that can carry more data than like a telephone wire, um, and also kind of much much more expensive on a like per uh, uh, per foot basis. Um, so you wouldn't want to like string an Ethernet cable sort of uh, across a town. Um, uh, that's an excellent question. It's uh, uh, a mix of governments and private companies. Um, this is something that's really remarkable about the internet. Uh, there is no, uh, there is an international organization, ICANN, I-C-A-N-N. -N. Um, don't remember what all those letters stand for, but it's kind of a uh, a voluntary organization that kind of comes up with the like rules for the internet, uh, but there's no like political power that is enforcing these rules. It's just people agreeing to work together. Uh, and there is no sort of central authority that kind of has control in any meaningful sense of the internet writ large. Fun. Um, so with the, when does, what does, like, before that anonymity start to... Um, yeah. So, uh, this is... Um, uh, I don't... Yeah, I, I, I don't know when exactly um, services like Tor, which uh, work to uh, hide who and what you're talking to. So, uh, when you... Uh, uh, connect to a website, uh, it might be possible for someone to observe that your computer is talking to the computer providing that website, um, but there are technologies that uh, use different techniques to hide that information. Um, uh, if I had to, to guess, I would, um, like the ideas relevant to something like Tor have been around for a long time, but its actual like use would have been late 90s, early 2000s, but I'd have to look exactly when um, that started to show up. All right, so let's get into a bit more uh, detail about how this whole network thing works. So a kind of, a fundamental way that a lot of networking works is along something called the server client model, uh, where we have some process that we'll call the client and uh, this client wants to connect uh, uh, wants to connect to a web page, um, and so the client is going to send a request to some server process, some just another process running, uh, maybe even on the same machine, but probably on different machines, um, and the server process is uh, connected to some that has the information for that web page. Uh, and so it gets this request, it goes and retrieves the resource that's being requested, some web page, and then it sends its response back to the client where the client's some web browser, it can now display that web page to you. The data that is kind of sent back and forth here, kind of underneath, is uh, sent 
back and forth in kind of small chunks called packets. Uh, so the um, there is certainly uh, a lot of the same ideas about buffers and uh, I/O that we have been talking about apply to this situation. When it comes to sending data over the network, there are uh, a significant number of complicating factors that don't come up when you're just communicating within an individual machine, uh, and a lot of the details of that kind of uh, infrastructure beyond the, the scope of what we'll get into. Um, the, the textbook and the notes cover, cover some of it, but kind of that is getting into a, a computer networks course in kind of more, more detail than, than we're going to need. Um, and so when we have this client-server model, uh, the way that we are going to and actually do this input output is uh, is to communicate via sockets. And if you remember from last time, one of the types of files that I listed out was a socket. It was a a special type of file that was for uh, uh, this kind of communication. And so a socket consists of, kind of a pair uh, a, 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 a pair of things. It is It is an address and a port. Um, and uh, this, uh, uh, this address is most often an internet protocol or IP address. Uh, so it might be if we have our client over here, it has a socket on its end, uh, which might be, have the address of 128.2.194.242, and uh, the majority of, of IP addresses have this form of a four-part uh, uh, four number where each of these numbers is between 0 and 255. Um, any guesses as to why each of these numbers is between 0 and 255? Why? Right? When 256 is a power 2, right? That's right. Any, anything special about 256? It is eight bits, or um, um, yeah. So it's so each of these is one byte. So we have a four byte address, and it's often written. It's just for to make it human readable. You you could write it in hex, but to make it human readable, it's often written as this these four decimal numbers separated by dots. Each one being one of the bytes. Um, so we have. The uh, client and uh, the uh, way this is often written is you write the address and then a colon and then the port. And a port is just a number that sort of unique, uh, uh, uniquely identifies a particular connection on this device. So maybe we have the excellent port of 208. Um, and the client is connected to the server, which has its own socket, so we have kind of one socket on either side of our connection. Um, and the server would have its own address, 
say 208, uh, 216, 181, 15. Uh, and if we're, say, connecting to get a web page, uh, that is typically done on port 80. It's kind of the default port for that. And so we have two, you know, our two sockets are kind of represented by these pairs of address and port. Kevin? Are all the addresses for bytes? Yes, so um, the most common IP addresses are 32 bits, uh, but we don't have enough of them because we have used all uh, pretty much all the 32-bit addresses, uh, and so there are um, uh, there is there are kind of so the, the 32-bit is IP version four. There's one that I don't remember whether it's 64 or 128, but a much bigger set of addresses called IPv6. Um, not all devices support IPv6. Uh, because we're out of IPv4 addresses, uh, they are very valuable. And um, at some point, Carlton acquired a large range of IPv4 addresses. And I think last year, Carlton sold off a chunk of these addresses um, for uh, a large amount of money, I think hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so, so valuable, valuable resources to be sure. Fine. So the V4 and V6 were created of four bytes and six is made of six? Uh, I know four is made of four bytes, so you're probably right that IPv6 is six bytes. That would make sense. Or is it just version six? Uh, I actually don't remember off the top of my head. Does anyone know? Uh, it's 128 bits. Okay, so six bytes would not be 128 bits. So uh, I think it's versions. Other questions? All right, so the reason why just the address is not all that we would want is uh, our server might actually kind of have multiple, uh, the, the kind of machine on which the server resides might actually be providing kind of multiple services or multiple uh, uh, things that the uh, uh, that the user can can ask for. So we might have uh, separately. Uh, if we wanted to connect to the server over SSH, uh, that it would be the same address, but SSH uses port 22. So getting a web page would use port 80, but connecting over SSH would use port 22, and thus would have kind of different sockets. So kind of we can imagine that the client's connection comes into the machine, and then that machine is identified by some address, and then based on the port that the client is trying to connect to, it would either go to SSH or to uh, the, the web page. Yeah. Uh, if I'm a server with multiple clients uh, talking to my port, like, do they have to, if they all want to talk to my you know, web page server, do they all connect to port 80? Can port 80 handle concurrent stuff? Um, yes. So uh, the way that this, uh, the kind of connections will come in on port 80. And what likely happens at that point is that the server will actually uh, maybe create a new process on a, with a separate socket to handle sending back the response. Uh, and you will actually uh, do this in uh, lab five. You'll implement a server um, that can handle kind of multiple incoming connections, and you'll do this by just creating a new process uh, for each one. Other questions? All right, so yeah, I do not have time to get into the example, uh, so that will have to wait until Monday. Um, but 
last few notes about sockets. Uh, this idea has been around for a long time. It emerged in the, in the 1980s with the sort of original uh, Unix operating system. Uh, sockets are used on all modern operating systems. They're the kind of, they are the, the way this communication tends to take place. Um, and it says again that these are going to be modeled as files, that we're going to be able to use uh, those same system calls, read and write, to send and receive bytes on the socket, just like we do with uh, a standard out or with some file on the disk. All right. Happy Friday. I will let you go. A reminder that Lab 4, due on uh, Monday, I have office hours, 10.30 a.m. Monday morning, and I'll see you then.